What are your thoughts on the Luminous Mysteries? Yeah, party on. Um, so they were what promulgated in 2002, I think. I think it's, um, uh, in like Oct- I think it was October something of 2002. But yeah, Saint John Paul II. I, I suppose he was looking at the landscape and said, "We go from Jesus is 12 and he's lost to his parents for three days, mm-hmm. thus, you know, kind of foretelling the resurrection." Um, and restored to them, I should say, thus foretelling the resurrection. And then we go from there to the agony in the garden. So it's like, holy smokes. Um, you get the impression that this man came into the world to die, which is true enough, but he also came into this world to live. And I think that returns us to the point mm-hmm. that I was harping on earlier, that all of the deeds and sufferings of Christ save. The, the baptism is an excellent example of this. Like, why is the Lord baptized? You ask that question, why are we baptized? Well, it's because we're born in sin, says Psalm 51. Uh, so we need baptism in order to be healed and grown beyond our fallen state. I mean, we remain fallen, but we can heal from some of it. We can grow beyond some of it uh, so that we can be receive this adoption as sons and daughters of God, grace, virtue, gifts of the Holy Spirit, all kinds of cool things besides. But, but none of that applies to Christ. Because he doesn't need to deal with sin, whether original or personal. He already is the natural son of God. He has grace, virtue, gifts of the Holy Spirit out the wazoo, if I can speak somewhat casually. Um, So why then is he baptized? St. Ambrose makes this observation and he says, when we, you know, have the waters poured upon us or are immersed in the waters, they cleanse us. Like that's the trajectory. Waters to us, cleansing goes on. In the case of Christ, when he's immersed in the waters, he cleanses them, Mm. which is to say he imparts to them the power to cleanse us. What does that even mean? So it's like he's He's instituting the sacrament. He's actually cleansing the waters that he's within. So what is he doing? Basically, he's instituting the sacrament of baptism. Okay. So by his institution of the sacrament of baptism, now when the minister of the church pours the water over an infant's head and says, you know, child, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that affects what it signifies. But it would have done that whether or not he was baptized. So it would have done that provided only that he instituted the sacrament of baptism. Yep. And so we see him institute the sacrament of baptism in his baptism, right? But like when we, with any of the sacraments, the sacraments have a power mm-hmm. to communicate a grace, right? So we would say that, that sacraments are signs of a sacred thing which make men holy. Uh, but we also say that each of them were instituted by Christ. So it's a contentious question in the Middle Ages whether that institution is mediated by the early church. But Christ, I just, I just don't know why we. Like, I don't know why Ambrose's point is so profound. We, you think of other, and I obviously I'm wrong. No, okay, no, 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 no. But no, no, I'm just great. trying to wrestle. No, with no it. you got You got to suss it out. Yeah. So, like, I mean, there are other sacraments that we don't see Christ engaging in specifically, like uh, no, extreme unction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it's not like that had to happen for him to somehow hallow all of the oil in the world or a specific type of. So it just it sounds cute and poetic, like. We we do this so we are cleansed. He does this so he can cleanse. Oh, that's that's nice. Or he absorbs the sin. Like I can see it, like in a in a kind of poetic interpretation. Yeah. But well, maybe maybe when you make it kind of literal and specific, I, maybe that's what I'm trying to do, and I shouldn't be doing. I'm no, not. it's good. Let's 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 keep going until you're satisfied or <laughs> until Jesus comes back. Um, so here's the thing about that gesture. Yeah. It's a strange gesture. So we, we to be re- baptized to, for him to be, be baptized. Yeah, that is strange. So it, for, it for merits one, questioning. Yeah. Him. So for yeah. one who is less than him, who acknowledges the fact that he is less than him, I'm not worthy to loosen the straps of your sandals. I should be mm. baptized by you, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the Lord says that it's necessary for the fulfillment of all righteousness. Okay. The word there being dikaiosune, which is like justice in the deepest sense of the term, which is to say to be made right with God. Mm. Okay. So he's saying this is for salvation. So that underlines the fact that all of the deeds and sufferings of Christ save, or that this, at the very least, this deed of Christ saves. So then you ask the question, how is the Lord saving? And the paradoxical nature of the gesture, I think, it makes that question more urgent. Because we know how baptism ordinarily saves. It makes you an adopted son of God. It gives you grace, virtue, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It does a lot of cool things. But none of those apply to Christ. So when you recount that, you know, in your own telling of the story, then you have to drill down. Like yeah. what's actually happening here? Yeah. And you can just say juridically he's instituting the sacrament. Cool. Okay. But yeah. what happens in sacraments? Visible signs communicate invisible graces. So the Lord is investing this visible thing with an invisible ability, as it were, or an invisible power. Mm-hmm. Right? So we would say, and we just quote the the woman who came up behind him in the crowd who had been hemorrhaging for twelve years. Um, so so power goes out from him. Even, you know, you just grab the hem of his garment, power goes out from him. And so you get a deeper appreciation in, you know, like praying through the baptism because we're talking about the luminous mysteries. You get a deeper appreciation for the power that goes out from him. And you get that also in the transfiguration. Like the Lord constrains his glory. Mm. I was preaching about this maybe yesterday. Yeah, it was yesterday. So 
we often think about, he, he said in the gospel yesterday, I'm meek and humble of heart, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and we think about that as like Christ is weak and he's initiating us into this slave mentality. I should say our atheistic contemporaries think that, but it's like, no. When we talk All right. About I want to God, say thank you to Emmaus Academy. They've put out this brand new digital platform to help you grow in your love of sacred scripture and therefore your love of Christ. If you're like me, you know how tempting it is just to waste so much of your day on YouTube, like maybe you're doing now or listening to political podcasts and other things. The truth is we do often have the time to grow in our knowledge and love of scripture. We just need a helping hand. And that's what this brand new digital learning platform is going to help you do. It has short courses on scripture that you can take. You can learn from Dr. Scott Hahn, uh, Dr. John Bergsma, Father Boniface Hicks, many more. I've been on this platform. I have a subscription to it. And um, I mean it when I say it's actually really excellent and it'll help you love scripture. I think a lot of us want to love scripture, but we find... We fight, we, I don't know, we, we feel guilty that we don't love it as much as we should. Platforms like this will help you do that. So click the link in the description, stpaulcenter.com slash Matt and sign up. When you sign up, you get two weeks free to the entire platform. I mean, think about how many times you and I have sub- subscribed to say Hulu or something else. Um, when we could be doing something like this and growing in our love of scripture. So again, stpaulcenter.com slash Matt. Go sign up today. You get two weeks for free. If you don't think it's worth it after that time, cancel it. You won't be charged a cent, but I think you'd be really impressed with what you see. So we often think about, he, he said in the gospel yesterday, I'm meek and humble of heart, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and we think about that as like Christ is weak and he's initiating us into this slave mentality. I should say our atheistic contemporaries think that, but it's like, no, when we talk about God, you know, he's not a tame God. When we talk about God, we're talking about overabounding life, but we're talking about overabounding power. Slow down, Gregory. You're getting ahead of yourself. Okay. So, um, and, and what we see in the incarnation is the Lord actually constrains his glory so that it doesn't destroy us, mm-hmm. right? So we, we talk about the weight of glory, that God is greater than our hearts, that we the eye has not seen nor ear heard, nor has it so much as dawned on the heart of man what God has ready for those who love him. So there's something potent here, all right? But God veils his radiance. God constrains his glory. God makes mute the word so that we can actually interact with him so that we can recognize and receive something which comes to us clothed in human vesture because otherwise it would tear us apart not in the sense that god is creepy right but in the sense that we're talking about being itself he whose very nature is to be everything else that we experience in this world is a limited sense of to be it's a it's like a kind of narrowed down sense of to be and so god in the incarnation he makes the divine causality like more tolerable for us in a certain sense and we see something of that in the baptism, in the transfiguration, because when the glory breaks through, it's like, holy smokes, mm. right? And not just in a poetic sense, but in a real sense. With the transfiguration, it, it grinds them under in the sense that they can't lift up their heads. It's not like, oh, let's bow. This is a holy thing. It's like they, they almost go to sleep. You know, it's so thick. Wow. The atmosphere is so thick. And I think you, you have something of that in the baptism. Like mm. the power goes out from him that it imparts to the waters the very capacity to cleanse. Okay. And that the Lord, in submitting to the baptism of John, showing his humility, it's not just like, oh, look how humble he is. It's like, look at the humility of the whole dispensation of salvation history, of God's dealing with men, of the divine condescension, of the abbreviated word, which adopts this posture so that he can speak to us face to face in the context of friendship and in the setting of friendship to draw us up into the communion of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So like, I think you can begin to get an intimation of that. Do you have to say all that to yourself while praying the baptism of the Lord? No, but I think that that's at work in it. Yeah. And I think you have contact with what is at work in it. And I think that changes you, which is like, even if you don't know what you're saying when you're praying the rosary, I think you have to account for the fact that 40 years later, this dad who led his family in the rosary now has sane kids. Wow. You know, it's like, how do, how do you, I mean, when 25% of this generation identifies as something other than, you know, heterosexual, you know, it's like, you, you, I mean, like this whole family, you know, they're all, I mean, and not to say like, parents who have seven kids and one of whom might be a little bit off the rails right now. It's not like you failed, but to say like, how do you account for sanity cross generationally, except Mm -hmm. God's fidelity, which is made manifest in, which is communicated through Mm -hmm. our sacramental practice, our life of prayer, our friendship, like the realness of our relationships, you know, whatever. So, yeah, that's really good. Luminous mysteries. Yeah. I'm, I'm for them. Yeah. You know, so I wear 150 on my, on my hip, like the aforementioned freshman. I wonder how panicked Dominicans were when that came out. Like, oh no, am I going to have to get, (laughs) this is going to be even longer. Yeah, exactly. The bead's going to have to get significantly smaller. 
Yeah, so I think there are reasons not to do it. You know, when you're thinking about St. John Paul II, 2001, he's like, should I, should I, should I? Mm. There are reasons not to because of, you know, this connection with the Psalms. There are 150 yeah. Psalms, so the Psalter of Our Lady. Breaks the imagery. Yeah, and also people have been doing it this way for a long time, so yeah. are we sure we want to? But it sounds like in the church there are already quite a few people who are already adding mysteries. And it of, also, to be clear, is a suggestion that yeah. John Paul II said was a suggestion. Yeah, yeah. That's so, important too. It's not like he was now mandating mm. something. Yeah, and then he kind of goes through and says, you know, you can pray these mysteries on these days if you're in the habit of praying the rosary every day. And yeah. he assigns those mysteries to Thursday because of the connection with the institution of the Eucharist, mm -hmm. which is cool, you know? So, yeah, I think let a thousand flowers bloom. Hey, thank you so much for watching. Before you go, do us a favor, leave a comment, let us know what you thought of the video, like, and subscribe.